Welcome to our second and final video on motor control and plasticity. In this video we're going to get into more detail talking about those components of the brain that are responsible for movement. And we're also going to touch upon disorders of movement and some of their causes and some of their treatments as well. So the primary motor cortex, as we've talked about before, is the brain region um, that's primarily responsible for movement, but as you'll see, the secondary motor cortex um, or non-primary motor cortex also plays a huge role with movement. So the primary motor cortex is located on the posterior side of the frontal lobe, just in front of the somatosensory cortex. So you can see right here, right in here. So um, your somatom motor cortex right there. Um, it is very important for planning and executing movements. In fact, as I mentioned before, if you have damaged the primary motor cortex, it results in partial paralysis on the contralateral side of the body. Uh, similar to what we saw in touch, there seem to be areas that are primarily res responsible um, parts of the primary motor cortex that are primarily responsible for different parts of the body. And similar to touch, these also seem to be related to the um, how sensitive those parts of the body are. Well, I should say for touch, it's about how sensitive those are. For motor, it's about how many fine motor movements or how much fine motor movement activity you need to do with those muscles. So what you see is, for instance, there's a great amount of the um, primary motor cortex devoted to your hand was significantly less, for instance, for your shoulder. So here we have the motor homunculus, which is similar to what we saw with the primary um, cortex for touch, where we see certain areas having a lot more influence, a lot more space in the primary motor cortex than others. So all the one thing that's worth mentioning is although it you know this display makes it look like it's nice and organized and in a way it is research is finding that there is there are quite a few exceptions to the rule so the primary motor cortex is probably not as specialized and as separate as as the image makes it look here but the the overall point is not lost, that you have different aspects of the primary motor cortex that are responsible for different um, body parts in their movement, and that the size of those corresponds with how many fine movements you need to make using those body parts. Also similar to what we saw in touch, there's plasticity with um, the primary motor cortex. And the more that an individual uses certain muscles, the larger its representation will be in the primary motor cortex. So, for instance, a pianist would likely have more room devoted to his or her hands than someone who doesn't play the piano. Though this may be changing with how much many of us type. Um, also, you have these images, um, these are actually of rats. So the image on your left is the primary motor cortex of a rat before training that requires use of fingers and wrists. And on the left, or on the right rather, you see after training. Um, so after 10 days of training, you see a significant increase in the amount of green at the expense of blue. And what this basically is showing is that our experiences can truly rewire the brain, even in just a matter of days. So just in front of the primary motor cortex, we find the supplemental motor area. Um, so this is the area. Um, it's also sometimes called the premotor area. And it makes up the non-primary motor cortex. So this is that secondary motor cortex that we discussed a little bit in the last slide, or last lecture rather. So despite not being the primary motor cortex, um, both of these areas really seem to be important for movement. For instance, patients with bilateral damage to the supplementary motor area will be unable to move voluntarily, though involuntary movement still is preserved.
So thus, we believe that the um, supplemental motor area is important for the initiation of movement. We also see activity in the SMA when we mentally rehearse movements. But what about when we see movements in the environment? The premotor cortex is actually activated when the movement is doubted by external stimuli. The premotor cortex is the home of mirror neurons, which are neurons that are active both when an individual makes a particular movement as well as when they see an individual, uh, another individual make the same movement. So they may help in explaining why the premotor cortex is important for creating behaviors based upon what we see in the environment. It's also been hypothesi hypothesized that these neurons may actually be important for understanding the behavior of others and also of empathy. Uh, some have even gone so far as to postulate that autism may be due to a deficit in these neurons. Though, I should say there's not substantial evidence of this to date. So you'll likely remember that the basal ganglia is important to movement. It receives its information from the cerebral cortex and sends this information back to the cortex through the thalamus. So you're also likely familiar with at least one disorder associated with damage to the basal ganglia. Two of the best known are Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. From these disorders, it is suspected that the basal ganglia plays a role in determining the amplitude and direction of movement. And it also likely plays a role in the initiation of movement. Activity in the basal ganglia is also co closely correlated with activity in the primary motor cortex. The cerebellum is also a very important um, brain component when it comes to movement. And like other parts of the brain, its size depends on the range and complexity of a person's movements. Unlike the basal ganglia, it's most strongly correlated with the supplemental motor area. So keep that in mind, basal ganglia is more correlated with the primary motor cortex, whereas your cerebellum is more correlated with the supplemental motor area. It's unique in the fact that it actually guides movement through sending inhibitory messages. So it's thought that the cerebellum is important for uh, forming and or forming of elaborate neural programs for skilled movement, especially rapid repeated movements that become automatic. It also plays a role in learning, as we will discuss a little bit later in the semester. So now we're going to turn our attention briefly to the disorders that we can see with movement. So there are many different disorders of the muscular system that can be caused by dysfunction at many different points within the system. Uh, muscular dystrophy is a disease that leads to the degeneration and functional changes in the muscles. The muscles start degrading in childhood so that by age 10, children will often need braces to walk and by 12, they're often forced to use a wheelchair. So the muscles start, you know, wasting away. And what happens is it's caused by an X-linked maladaptive gene that starves the body of dystrophin, which is a protein that is needed for normal muscle function. So these individuals will have normal muscle function up until about 10 and then the muscles start uh, wasting away. As we mentioned earlier, acetylcholine is a very important neurotransmitter when it comes to movement. Um, in myasthenia gravis, an individual experiences a profound weakness due to an autoimmune disorder in which the patient develops antibodies to their own acetylcholine receptors. So the immune system attacks these receptors. It can be treated either with acetylcholinesterase inhibitors to increase the amount of acetylcholine, as well as immunosuppressants to suppress the immune system attacking of the acetylcholine receptors. Polio, um, I don't even know how many of you have heard of polio. It's, you rarely hear of it anymore. Um, it's a disease that's caused by a virus that destroys motor neurons, which of course leads eventually to paralysis um, as those are the neurons that the brain uses to send the signals to the muscles.
In its later stages, patients would often have to be on ventilators because they'd be unable to breathe on their own. Thankfully, polio is much rarer than it used to be um, due to the polio vaccine, but it's still present, especially in third world countries. ALS. Um, ALS is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease um, because the famous baseball player had ALS and died of ALS. Um, it's a disease in which the motor neurons in the brain stem and spinal cord spontaneously start to die, and their target muscles therefore waste away. So the person gradually worsens and becomes weaker and weaker until paralysis occurs. So Stephen Hawking, um, a British physicist, has been able to be very successful despite having ALS, though he now has to communicate uh, through a speech-generating device because of how far the disease has progressed. Parkinson's disease is caused by the death of dopamine-producing cells in the substantia nigra. As a result, um, it causes a loss of facial muscle tone, making the face have more of a mask-like appearance. And it also causes um, great difficulty with motor activity and also a tremor. It is associated with depression and also cognitive difficulties. So Parkinson's is caused by the development of Lewy bodies, which are abnormally shaped proteins that lead to um, cell death in the substantia nigra. L-DOPA and electrical stimulation have both been shown to improve Parkinson's symptoms, but not stop the progression of the disorder. So L-DOPA we've talked about a little bit. Remember that we can't just give someone more dopamine, they can't get through the blood-brain barrier. So we give L-DOPA, which is one of the precursors of dopamine. So the thought is that while you have fewer, you have less dopamine because you have fewer neurons that are making dopamine, one way you can maximize that is giving all the building blocks you need for dopamine so that the building blocks are not the rate limiting factor. They have plenty of um, the building blocks in order to produce the dopamine. You likely know Huntington's disease as the disease that 13 had on the show House. It is caused by a abnormal dominant gene for um, the gene, it's actually called Huntington, which, like Parkinson's, it leads to abnormal protein development. Symptoms usually start to show in the mid-30s to the early 40s with motor or minor problems in mood and cognition, followed by difficulties with coordination and also unsteady gait. As time goes on, you have jerky body movements that become apparent. And this, along with cognitive decline and psychotic problems, also become very evident at this point. There's unfortunately no cure for Huntington's, which um, in its later stages requires full-time care. Um, and unfortunately, these later stages can last 20 years or more. So it's really a devastating disorder. And lastly, damage to the cerebellum can also result in movement problems. Spinocerebellar um, damage results in abnormalities of gait and posture. Ataxia, or the loss of coordination, may appear in the legs with this. And you also can see this with long-term alcoholism that can cause ataxia and also induce uh, swaying when walking. Damage to the... Um, Cerebrosparabellum can also cause what we call decomposition of movement, which is where gestures are made in segments. So body movements are often very jerky. So if I'm shaking your hand, I may actually move my hand in these jerky little movements instead of as one smooth movement. Um, also damage here in this area can cause um, cognitive deficits as well. And lastly, damage to the vestibular cerebellum um, produces errors in gaze and also difficulty tracking visual objects. <laughs>